I'm Jill Spritz. I'm the Michigan State Director for the Humane Society of the United States, um, based in Lansing, uh, but work on issues all over the state. Um, state Director is mainly our job is to uh, whatever HSUS is doing at the national level, whatever issues and campaigns we cover at the national level, I work on at the state level. So uh, I'll go over some of the things that we cover here, but we basically just cover just about anything to do with animals, um, uh, all animals. So, uh, just real briefly, because there's some um, some information, misinformation going on out there about um, what the HSUS does. We are uh, established in 1954. We are uh, the nation's largest uh, animal protection organization uh, with about 11 million members and supporters nationwide and about 350,000 members and supporters here in the state of Michigan. Uh, you'll see our logo up there. Uh, it's kind of small there, but you've seen it around. It's, uh, it has 19 different animals sort of symbolize that our mission is to protect all animals, not just cats and dogs, which we do uh, very vigorously, but we also protect all animals, including wildlife, sea life, uh, farm animals, you name it. So that's part of our mission. Um, and uh, the goal, again, is a more humane and sustainable world for all animals. Uh, our motto is celebrating animals and confronting cruelty. Uh, which means that we uh, not only rescue animals in distress and provide hands-on care uh, and rescue for animals, but we also work at addressing the root causes of animal cruelty through legislation, uh, litigation, education uh, around the world. So, uh, just some of the other things we work on, we provide a lot of animal uh, shelter support, we provide training and professional standards and everything we do from anim in animal shelter volunteer management, board management, shelter sanitation, uh, we also publish Animal Sheltering Magazine, which you'll see out on our table there. Please take a copy of that. And our website, animalsheltering.org, has tons of free resources available at everything from volunteer management to shelter architecture. So if you're looking at building a new shelter or doing whatever, we have resources available to help you there. Uh, we put on the largest animal care, uh, animal uh, sheltering conference in the world uh, every year. This year it will be in Orlando. Um, in um, May, uh, May 4th to the 7th, so I encourage everyone to attend Animal Care Expo uh, in Orlando. Uh, we also put on a shelter partners program. If you join up, you get a lot of discounts on services. Uh, and then we also provide direct grants and assistance to animal shelters. So please, uh, my car's on the table. Please see me if you have any questions about any of that. We have an animal cruelty rescue and response team that works with uh, Homeland Security and natural disasters like hur hurricanes, floods, you name it. Uh, and our animal cruelty response team also works with law enforcement uh, in large scale cruelty cases such as animal fighting bus, puppy mill bus, hoarding cases, et cetera. So you've probably seen uh, a lot of these on the news recently. We've um, done those all over the country, uh, even here in Michigan, so in Indiana and Ohio recently as well. Uh, our Humane Society Veterinary Medical Association uh, provides free care in uh, extremely uh, underserved uh, populations such as Native American reservations and in Appalachia and other parts of the world. We go in for a week, set up an entire full service veterinary clinic and provide free spay and neuter and every kind of service imaginable for the uh, community. Uh, and we do that around the country in conjunction with veterinary schools. Uh, and we also fund new spay and neuter programs at uh, uh, veterinary schools, uh, such as at Louisiana State and Mississippi State, to help set up uh, after the treatment. So, uh, we operate six large wildlife and animal care centers around the country, three wildlife care centers, one in Cape Cod, uh, one in South Florida, and one in Southern California. Uh, we also operate the Duchess Horse Sanctuary in Oregon and the Indoor State Horse Sanctuary in Texas. And the, uh, and the uh, Black Beauty Ranch in Texas as well. Uh, we're one of the largest providers of wildlife care in the country, and we're currently caring for more horses than any other rescue or sanctuary provider in the country. So uh, a lot of work in hands-on animal care as well. Um, if, you, if you get a chance, uh, visit our website to see all the other campaigns we work on, uh, from animal fighting to factory farming to the fur industry, trapping, fur farming, uh, the use of chimpanzees and research, our wildlife abuse campaign addresses things such as uh, pigeon shoots and uh, captive hunting. And of course, uh, one of our main goals is uh, eliminating horse slaughter uh, in the United States. So working on federal legislation uh, in that area. So, but as far as our puppy mills campaign, uh, we have many different areas where we try to educate the public uh, and work with law enforcement and, and consumers to educate them about puppy mills. 
Uh, in the area of educating consumers, we have information on learning the basics of pet store and double speak, what to look for. Uh, when, when you hear from pet store employees, we probably all have when you've gone in there and tried to talk to them. They'll have all sorts of excuses and reasons for where they get their animals and just for good breeders and things like that. So we have a lot of resources on our websites on what, to, what you're going to hear and what they really mean by those things. Uh, and then um, also um, how to look through uh, those deceptive ads from uh, the large-scale puppy molds that you see online. So they'll always have the pretty pictures of the puppies and the cute animals and everything. Uh, but what to look for when you're looking for them. And educating people about the fact that a, a good, truly responsible breeder is not going to be selling their pet, pet stores anymore. They want to know who they're selling them to and where their animals are going to be. So not going to be shipping them out to a pet store. So, uh, we also feature a lot of inspiring stories on our website about uh, folks who work uh, to rescue puppy mill dogs, like this young guy. Um, uh, his dad is a veterinarian who helps uh, our Indiana State Director with a lot of puppy mill dogs, so he, he's always in there helping with the dogs. Uh, our Kind News, which is our publication that we put out on the website for young people, uh, has a lot of puppy mill education on there, too. And then we publish a, a guide. Uh, and an activist guide to stopping puppy mills, which you can find on our website to help you start your own puppy mill campaign if you want to be right in your own area. Um, another area that we uh, work on puppy mills and, and probably much more better known uh, is our investigations. We uh, do undercover investigations uh, in all kinds of puppy mills around the country. And probably uh, the most famous one was our pet line investigation. This was the result of an eight-month investigation uh, that we released the results of in November of 2008. Uh, we investigated um, and documented 322 different suppliers of almost 17,000 puppies from different resources going uh, to supplying pet land stores around the country. Uh, we visited at random 35 breeding and brokering <coughs> operations. These are operations, as, as you probably know, that are licensed by the USDA to breed or broker uh, pets that are, that are going to end up in pet stores. Uh, we obtained records, extensive records, through the Freedom of Information Act for these breeding and brokering facilities. Uh, and uh, we documented all sorts of the puppies uh, that were sold to 76 different pet line stores. Uh, and we found uh, about, we found 140 so stores selling tens of thousands of puppies every year. We visited the stores themselves, uh, as, as well as the breeders and the brokers, and uh, we found a lot of things that are probably not surprising to a lot of you, uh, but to the general consumer, is in that the puppies that are ending up in these pet land stores are coming from massive, huge Midwest commercial breeders, uh, many of which you already know about, uh, and that's sort of the puppy mill capital, as it's called in Missouri but also other states like Minnesota, uh, where they have some massive, uh, horrible mills with upwards of 1,300 dogs in one uh, location. That one in particular was shut down, unfortunately, but uh, for the most part, they're still going. Uh, and some of the conditions that we found, again, not a surprise to most of you, we're talking about being really bare and filthy cages with wire floors, and the feet uh, falling through the floors, or getting cut or stuck on the wire floors, uh, stinking uh, horribly up here in uh, an inadequate socialization, of course. Um, we found that a lot of them are being supplied, the, the pets, pet lands themselves are being supplied not directly from the breeders, but by brokers, huge mis Midwestern brokers who are getting animals from different sources and brokering them. And some of the uh, puppies ordered by the pet land stores were, were being ordered through an auction website. So when they claim, yeah, we, we go in and research directly and, and visit these breeders ourselves and we can vouch for them, what we found through the records is they're just going to an auction website called the Pet Board of Trade and just, and just getting the lowest bidder there. So, uh, more than 60% of the inspection reports for the breeder supplying pet land had serious violations. Uh, dirty enclosures, inadequate shelter from the cold, as you can see up here, small dogs being kept outside and conditions like that. Um, inadequate veterinary care, etc. And some of these breeders were found with sick and dead dogs. Hey, Jill. Uh, in the cage. Do you want me to comment on our pet land? We have one, we have one pet land in Michigan. Um, it's a Novi 12 Oaks Mall. And they do work with um, so many different breeders, but their primary broker is in Ohio named Abe Miller. And he works with a lot of the Amish um, facilities in Ohio. He supplies most of the dogs to the Novi. He's a, he's a large broker with many violations. Mm -hmm. And Pamela will go into much more detail of the research that we're yeah. doing 
And then mostly Pam yeah. is doing really. His, his second yeah. supplier is Opal Featherstone out of Missouri, and most of their animals come from Missouri that are not coming from Ohio. So that was the, the first round of our investigation. Uh, then we did a follow-up um, where we started um, investigating the transport records of, of more than 15,000 puppies that were shipped to 126 Petland stores. And uh, we did a more in-depth investigation into the brokers themselves. These were what are called Class uh, B licensed brokers. They can obtain uh, pets from different breeders and then sell them <coughs> to the stores and they hold them. And they also are able to breed animals as well as broker them. Um, you've probably heard of one of them. The Hunt Corporation is one of the most notorious uh, in Missouri, uh, but also another one, Mid-America, Pet Broker, Tracy, KJ, Pets, etc. Uh, all had uh, substantial Animal Welfare Act violations, improper veterinary oversight, cramped cages, uh, unsafe transport vehicles. And remember, these are all coming from places like Missouri, Minnesota. Uh, so you can imagine how many hours of travel I came from in those. 17 hours in Arkansas. 17 hours from Arkansas <laughs> for these all little dogs and, and occasions to come up to places like Novi and Westland. Um, we found that several were purchasing from unlicensed sources. According to the Animal Welfare Act, if you are a pet store, you can only get your dogs or cats from licensed USDA licensed Class A or Class B breeders or brokers. We found that some are not. They are getting them from animals that are not, uh, from breeders or brokers who are not licensed by the USDA. And uh, we studied 100, more than 100 of the individual breeders and more than half were cited for Animal Welfare Act violations. <coughs> if you're familiar with the Animal Welfare Act, it, it uh, provides uh, some standards of care, uh, mainly housing, food, water, ventilation, veterinary care, exercise, etc. They're not real great, but they are some standards of care. and. Uh, Almost half of these breeders and brokers could not even use those very basic standards of care, including cage outside, sick or injured dog, wire flooring, a real big thing, as you can imagine. Uh, a lot of times the dogs, when they're stuck in the cage, the whole life their claws will get stuck or will go around these little uh, these wires in the bottom of the you know, cage floors. Um, sanitation, of course, rusty cages, uh, matted underweight. We've gone into, when we've done pu puppy mill bus, uh, and you've probably seen a picture of these, where, where some of the dogs are so mad that you can't tell what kind of dogs they are. Uh, in some cases, now you can't even tell what kind of what sex they are. Um, it, it's a pretty sad situation. And then you can imagine the skin conditions that uh, are a result of that. Um, improper medications, that's another thing the Animal Welfare Act does stipulate, proper medications, storage, uh, and veterinary records, and things like that. Uh, and then outdoor runs again with that energy. So. Uh, another aspect of our puppy mill campaign is a pet, puppy friendly pet store campaign where we approach pet stores asking them to sign a pledge saying they will no longer sell puppies in their store. They will only provide uh, adoption uh, options for local rescues or local animal shelters instead. Uh, Michigan, thanks to Pam, um, was a record holder. We, we have more puppy friendly pet store pledges in the state of Michigan than any other state in the country. Mm -hmm. Our puppy mill activism in Michigan is absolutely well, well ahead of the curve, by the way. And Pam would be too modest to say it, but if you get a chance out on our table, uh, it is our most recent All Animals magazine from the HSUS. There's a feature uh, on Pam and her work in Michigan in there. Uh, so she'll autograph a copy for you. Oh. <laughs> 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 In any case, this is just another way that we use as part of our puppy mill campaign to educate um, uh, pet stores and pet supply stores, such as Pet Supplies Plus, was, uh, did wonderful with us. Their, their corporate office um, signed, signed the pledge. So all Pet Supplies Plus have made that promise. They won't be selling puppies, only, only supplies, and only have any options out there. So. And then they get to hang this uh, sign in their, their, uh, their window, and that says, please pour your little shelter. It's really important. Another thing that we do is the HSUS Maddie's Fund Puppy Mill Task Force. Um, this is a, a group of staff that work with law enforcement and animal shelters uh, to investigate puppy mills, uh, develop cases, and we help law enforcement once a warrant has been obtained to execute a raid, get the animals out of the situation into a safe place, whether it's a temporary shelter or directly into uh, new homes or foster homes. And we can provide guidance to local law enforcement agencies too. Uh, in the prosecution of animal abusers um, with regard to puppy mills. Um, 
Uh, we have posters available. I'm sorry I don't have any out at our table at the moment. Uh, but we have a tip line, one eight seven seven mill tip Please contact us if you think there is a puppy mill in your community. We will do that. be glad to help advise you on investigating that or, or working with our own investigation department uh, to see if there's anything we can do about that. But, um, you can visit that at our animal sheltering website, animalsheltering.org slash PMTF for puppy mill funds. Uh, we work on federal legislation and state legislation with regard to puppy mills. With federal legislation in particular, uh, a very exciting bill. Um, it was introduced in the last session of Congress. It didn't make it through, so we just got reintroduced. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, and, and, and you might already know this, so forgive me if I'm, if I'm being repetitive, but um, in order for uh, breeders or brokers to sell their pets to pet stores, they have to have a Class A or Class B license. However, if you are a breeder and you just want to sell pets directly to the public through the internet, uh, free to go to or, or ads in the newspaper or just word of mouth, whatever it is, then there is no federal oversight or regulation whatsoever of your facility. So um, there was a, a legislation introduced last session and, and reintroduced now called the PUPS Act, like uh, pup, something uniform, Pet Uniform Protection Act or something which basically says that if you sell more than a certain amount of dogs per year, um, whether it's to puppies, uh, pet stores, or to the general public, uh, then you are automatically uh, subject to the uh, standards of the Animal Welfare Act, and you have to get a license and be inspected by the USDA, uh, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. Uh, as I said, the standards aren't real great. They cover food, water, ventilation, vet care, exercise, etc. but at least it's something. It is some federal uh, and oversight and some regular inspection, the yearly inspection uh, by USDA inspectors if you are a breeder and you sell just directly to the public. So. What is the number on that of how many puppies um, they can? Is it 50? I think it's 50 if you sell probably 50. 50 dogs a year or more. Is it just puppies or dogs? Or it's just dogs, unfortunately. I don't think cats are included in that. Um, I mean a, adults versus puppies. Yeah, um, I think so. Yeah. I don't have the language in front of me. Oh, okay. I'll look that up. Um, that was introduced. It has already been introduced by Jim Gerlach, um, Pennsylvania Republican, and, and a couple other sponsors. So uh, you can contact your uh, con congressional representatives and ask them to support the Pubs Act. Um, so that's pretty exciting. That will at least provide some regular inspection and federal oversight of all uh, retail breeders as well as um, commercial breeders, uh, those who sell, or uh, wholesale breeders who sell pens. So. As far as state laws, we work with uh, um, uh, activists around the country in helping state laws to be passed. You can see in Iowa, the, the first dog um, helped with the signing of uh, an Iowa bill. Um, Wisconsin was very exciting. A couple of years ago, they had been working for at least 10 years in Wisconsin to try to get a bill passed there. A uh, huge puppy mill state finally was passed uh, in 09. That's the uh, then Governor Ruth Doyle signing it there. Um, and other states as well. Um, Prop B in Missouri, you guys might be familiar with that. That was a ballot initiative that uh, passed in Missouri last November. Um, it would, in the pub, largest puppy mill state in the country, would have enacted some pretty good standards for uh, housing, uh, no wire cage floors, et cetera, veterinary care, rest between breeding cycles, and most importantly, what was most exciting to us, it would have put, it did, when it was passed, put a cap of 50 breeding dogs in every breeding facility in the state of Missouri. <coughs> now 50 sounds like a lot to us, but in that state where they could have hundreds and hundreds of breeding dogs in their facilities, uh, there would now be a limit where no breeding facility in the state of Missouri could have more than 50 intact breeding dogs uh, there at one time. So we were very excited about that. It was a close vote, but it passed, and we thought that was just real wonderful until the new legislature went into session in January and made it their goal in life to kill this ballot initiative. Um, they were not happy by the fact that the votes uh, were mainly, the votes for the Prop B were mainly in the urban areas, and the rural votes were generally against it. Well, that's no big surprise, but we can imagine where all the puppy was. But you don't get to pick and choose which votes you like and which black votes you don't like. Unless you're in the Missouri legislature, uh, where they just passed through the House and the Senate a bill to basically go. 
Prop B. So we took out the limit and uh, most of the provisions. Okay, it's on the governor's desk now. We're hoping they'll be told. But if you have any friends or family in Missouri, and you can call them and ask them and ask them. Uh, governor to veto it, that would be great. Uh, we don't have great votes for that. But sadly, uh, when we see some victories uh, for animals like that, it's helping those um, the legislature can turn around and just say, well, Missouri voters, well, too bad you're voting in yeah. so, That's a very sad thing. Um, but here in the state of Michigan, um, Michigan Humane Society will soon be introducing their own legislation uh, with language that is very similar to what did pass in Missouri. Uh, they will have cap, uh, caps and standards, um, and, and we suggested some things uh, that we thought should be in the language, and Michigan Humane put most of these things in. Um, adequate time, you can't have the stacked cages, the wire floors, sufficient room, exercise, rectic and breeding cycles, uh, and again, most importantly, uh, a limit on the number of intact breeding animals that you can have in the facility. And Pam will go into more, when she talks about our kennel study, we found that that limit would not affect very many Michigan breeding facilities because Michigan generally does not have a huge puppy mill problem on the scale that other Midwestern states have. Not these mega mills with hundreds and hundreds of animals. So, well, we have found more with our research and with our experience in busting these places that the more animals you get, the more problems you have. So, uh, that should be introduced, uh, we hope, soon. and. Um, but that's what we're doing as far as legislation here in Michigan. We help, uh, we did a study that Pam will go into details about in order to uh, inform uh, Michigan Humane Society's um, efforts to give them the research they needed to write a good bill. And that or not. Uh, just a little more information about resources that we have on our website, um, and, uh, Advocate Toolkit, uh, just with some basics of how to talk to your legislators and, and how to get a bill passed or a local ordinance. Sorry that you are kind of long, but um, you should, if, right when you go to our very front page on the right side, you should see just take action. You should see it right there. So. Uh, I encourage everybody, if you can, to come to the Humane Lobby Day on April 13th. Uh, we'll be doing it in conjunction with Puppy Mill Awareness. There's Pam last year with Rudolph, a deaf and blind puppy mill survivor, White Jackson, very cute. He lobbied uh, on the, at the Senate. <laughs> in the House uh, for Puppy Mill legislation last year. So, um, but we'll be talking about a lot of different bills, puppy mills, and, and our other bills will be working on gas chamber, ban, column seizure, et cetera. Um, but definitely addressing puppy mills. Yeah. And if you can too, uh, we have a great conference every year in Washington, D.C. called Taking Action for Animals. Uh, where we'll be lobbying the federal legislation then on puppy mills. Uh, I encourage you to visit that. It's in July. It's very hot in D.C. in July and muggy, but it's a lot of fun. So I encourage everybody to try to make it there as well. I hope I didn't take up too much of time. Oh, there I am. <laughs> Sorry. I'm screwing through that one. So, um, does anyone have any questions about our puppy mill campaign or puppy mill legislation? I have a question. Just, um, the store owners or the pet stores that sell puppies, are they, can you ask to see papers and where exactly the puppy came from? Will it state, you know, Mahan Corporation or well, they have to have interstate veterinary records. You know, if you bring in animals from out of state, they have to have a certain uh, a veterinary exam through the uh, whatever Department of Agriculture of the state they came from. But as far as I know, I've been this, done a search for all those records, you have to FOIA them through the department. Well, if, you, if you go to a pet store and they get them locally, um, they're not required by law to tell, we don't have a disclosure law that requires pet stores to tell you where they're not. Where they got them from. But if it's a purebred, and you say, well, um, I'd like to see the registration papers. They feel really daily. Sometimes you have to ask several times. <laughs> right. Eventually, if they bring out registration papers, um, it'll say the breeder's name on there. But a lot of them are designer dogs, and they're just not registered. Designer and expensive. Yeah, like the mixed <laughs> dogs aren't registered. <laughs> so you, they, they're not required by law to give you that information. <coughs> well, do the large-scale mill do designer dogs? And so then they don't have to disclose that? No. Yeah. Yes, they do, and no, they don't. The pet stores don't have to tell you though, where they come from. But if they're coming from out of state, I have the shipping records, so I know where a lot of them come from. That's how I know. This is probably more for you, but why is that one in total small still operating? Well, they probably have a five-year lease. 
Pam, we know about you in St. Joseph County, and we're supporting you. Great. Well, thank you. 